thought I'd just spend a few minutes today and talk about what the environment as we see it for healthcare is, some issues that entrepreneurs should think about, <clears throat> and how the venture capital community plays a role in innovation. Um, but to back up, um, who funds innovation? The people that really fund innovation are people like Ontario Teachers, OMERS, and other big pension funds. And we have to go and raise capital uh, from them. And what they do is they have, a, you know, CalPERS is one of our uh, investors. They have about $150 billion. And they take about 5 or 6% of their capital and put it into alternative investments, real estate, venture capital, leverage buyouts, um, and the like. And the idea is that instead of just buying stocks or bonds, they can get a better return if they invest in these alternative investments. But what's happened in the last couple of years is uh, there's a lot of pressure um, on these firms. We heard this morning about innovation taking decades and maybe even 100 years. Um, and these firms that fund innovation and fund firms like ours are really running into issues where they need to get quicker returns because they have such needs uh, for their retirees. Or, 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 and that's created them focusing on this industry, healthcare, and I would say venture capital in general, um, where timelines that used to be seven to 10 years are kind of in the four to seven year time frame. <clears throat> Just this weekend, I mentioned CalPERS. CalPERS takes 6% of their 130 billion and puts it into alternative investments. And of that alternative, they allocate 10% to the venture capital community. Um, they announced over the weekend that they were going to take that allocation down to 1%. So one of the questions we really have is uh, um, if the venture capital industry is important and if it helps fund innovation, um, who's going to do it? If Ontario Teachers doesn't do it, if CalPERS doesn't do it, State Duke University doesn't do it, and the like. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and this all comes in the, at a time that's kind of remarkable. Just a month or two ago, um, it was announced that the seven billionth person was on the planet. And the notion or the idea here is that every 12 years we'll add another billion people. So 12 years from now we'll have eight billion people on the planet. We heard this morning about the demographics in the United States, it's about 15,000 people every day uh, turn 60 years old for the foreseeable future. So going forward, how do we provide food or healthcare or energy for this growing, growing population. And as, as I listened to this morning, I was thinking about um, innovation in healthcare. And have we done a decent job allocating capital to the healthcare industry? Um, over the last 15 years, we've spent a trillion dollars, one trillion dollars on cancer drugs that didn't work. The third largest killer in the United States are side effects from drugs, third largest killer. Um, the top pharmaceutical companies around the world spent almost um, $500 billion in the last decade on research and development. So things and the argument, and this is what the Ontario teachers and CalPERS and the like see, they're saying, do we get a decent return on all this capital we're spending on innovation? Um, and things are going to change. What's going to happen is that um, drug companies won't be able to just sell their drug. They'll only get reimbursed if the drug works. And right now, drugs only work in 40, 50% of the people that take them. Um, going forward, these new breakthroughs that we have, we're not going to get paid for. We, the pharmaceutical industry, is not going to get paid for, but rather only if the drug helps patients. It's a real new world. And we really are in the United States in the midst of this transformation of a fee-for-service business um, to a capitation business. So the insurance companies are saying, I'll give you $30,000 for this hip replacement. You spend it however you want. You know, operating room, intensive care unit, um, medicines, and um, uh, that's all we're going to pay you for, the, for various disease states. And it's gotten very hard. I just saw something this weekend also. Uh, of the, in the biotech industry, 45% of biotech CEOs say that the FDA hurts the industry. 
a remarkable number. And we talked before this morning about balancing risk and reward. Um, but to have the entire industry not, not only be neutral about the FDA, but say that they actually hurt the industry, in my mind, was somewhat remarkable. Um, and, and so what's happening is that particularly the big pharma companies are in trouble right now. If you look at somebody like Glaxo, they have 33 drugs in phase three, and 70% of them were developed outside the country, outside the company. So it used to be big pharma companies always developed their own drugs. Today, they're partnering more and more. Um, I was speaking with the head of uh, research at Glaxo. Another, he told me that there's one scientist, talk about innovation, one scientist at GSK has six new drug applications in drugs on the market. Three scientists at GSK have three drugs on the market. 5,000 people in R&D at GSK have no drugs on the market. And they're really trying to figure out what to do in the very near term, Lipitor is coming off a patent at Pfizer. Um, if you look at a company like Pfizer, they've spent $8 billion over the last decade per year, $80 billion, you know, research and development. And Pfizer has produced um, one new drug. Everything else was acquired or unlicensed. That drug was Viagra. Other than that, Pfizer's produced no new drugs. And so what they're doing is they're taking a real hard look at their portfolios and spinning them out into new companies. There's talk about buyouts of the big pharma companies and things like that. And really the game that they're playing today is simply um, uh, protecting their dividend. So people like Pfizer, Roche, kind of dividend five to 6%. Um, and that's really the only reason you, uh, you own the stock. Um, in, in the midst of all this, the innovation that's happening is quite remarkable. It's just recently been shown uh, for the last decade or so after the Human Genome Project. People thought the differences between our DNAs was about 0.1%. It's actually between 2 and 4%. We have this huge new understanding um, what's happening uh, in real time. Um, I read an article that said uh, in our bodies we have about 100 trillion cells. We have 200 trillion bacterial cells. But for the first time as it relates to innovation in North America, there was more scientific literature and patents issued and written about outside of North America than inside of North America, first time ever. So the question is, who's really winning the uh, innovation game? And we heard a little bit about this this morning um, from John, but the whole notion going forward is a very personalized view of medicine. You have to give the right drug to the right person at the right time. T today you have high cholesterol or you get Lipitor. Tomorrow your high cholesterol is gonna be different than my high cholesterol. And when we figure that out, we're going to be able to then really target um, drugs to people in its so-called era of uh, personalized medicine. So what's an entrepreneur to do in an environment like this? Um, we think about it, we see about 750, 800 proposals per year end up investing in maybe seven or eight companies, maybe 10 companies. Um, and people that are entrepreneurs say, what makes a good company? If I want to start a company, or what makes a good meeting? And I really think it's four things that we think about. Um, one, can the entrepreneur describe for us the value proposition? What is, it, what is it that's different? We need to understand, why should we invest now? Is this the right time to invest, or should we wait till you have more data? What are the implications of waiting? What are the implications of investing now? Does the management team have clear vision of the strategy and goals? It's remarkable to us sometimes we see companies come in in the, in the you know, pain space and really don't know what's going on outside their company. And then lastly, um, do we understand not only the upside but the risks? We had, I had a meeting with somebody a week or so ago. I said, what are the real risks here? And the CEO said, I don't, I don't really see any. 
And that was a huge warning flag for, uh, for us. So as an entrepreneur and thinking about being in the life sciences business or the healthcare business, there's really three things you have to do. Fund, get funding, which is basically a full-time job. Preserve the funding, make it last as long as you can, and optimize the funding. Are we spending the money on the right projects um, in the right amounts? And as we think about the venture capital business and funding innovation, a number of things have changed. It used to be you start a company, you get some friends and family, uh, get you off the ground, then you would do what they call a Series A round, and then a Series B round, and then a Series C round. Today, companies are coming in with ideas and raising Series A rounds that are $100 million. We've done two of those in the last two years. Um, it used to be proof of concept is what you were looking for. So there's a kind of proof of concept, can we get there? Um, today, it's proof of relevance. It's because you have a proof of concept. Um, is it relevant to the market? And tomorrow, it's going to be proof of reimbursement. Is somebody going to pay for this drug? In the venture community, when we start these companies and get them off the ground, we used to fund to get to an IPO or to a merger or an acquisition. Um, today, the venture capital community is looking at um, funding to profitability. So we look, at, we look at it and say we can't rely on public markets, we can't rely on Pfizer, we can't rely on other people to take us out of these investments. I mentioned before, in the old days, the LP timeframes were pretty long, and they could wait up to 10 years for something to pay off. The timelines have significantly shortened. And we're now in an era back then when LPs were looking for, to make 10 times, or G, uh, VCs were looking to make 10 times their money for the LPs. Today, two times your money is a major home run. And most pension plan, plans, including the couple that I mentioned before, if they can just get 5 to 6% returns on their overall portfolio, they're in pretty good shape and they can meet their pension obligations. We don't have to shoot for the uh, um, home run. Before, the lines were very clear. The venture capital community, Wall Street, pharmaceutical industry, and the roles that we played today, it's blurred. We see a lot of companies that come in and do um, innovative things, like partner up and give a big company an option to get acquired um, before they even start the company. We see acquisitions happening where instead of just upfront money, there's mi uh, milestones and, and the like. So th th that's really been different. It used to be we wanted to try to build companies that had multiple programs. If one failed, there was going to be another one coming down the pike. Um, today, the real word is capital efficiency and, and virtual. Pfizer just made an acquisition of a company over the weekend for a pretty good amount of money, uh, five employees. It used to be that people like us were kind of the mainstay of, of uh, funding these companies. One of the things that's changed is that the ri there's been a real rise of the corporate venture capital community. Most of the big pharma companies and device companies have their own venture capital funds. And the advantage there is that where we're at the mercy of Ontario Teachers or Cowpers or Welcome Trust or somebody, uh, the Novartis Venture Fund only has one limited partner. Um, they become much more mainstream. Back then, science was all that matters. You have good science, somebody will fund it, and somebody will pay for it down the road. Today, it's business. And science will only get you so far. Um, in the past, we just wanted to we talked a little bit about this this morning, drugs and devices that work better. You know, right now, we need drugs and devices that work better and cost less. So the rules, if, if for those of you that uh, um, are thinking about starting companies, the rules of the game are changing very quickly. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we're trying to do in the United States, I sit on the board of the biotechnology industry organization, uh, and we've put a forth a few proposals to help spur innovation, particularly in the United States. Um, one is we're trying to look at a different tax structure so that we get better capital gains if you, if you have a longer holding period um, and entice people to invest in the sector 
and have longer term uh, horizons. Two, one of the ways the industry got going 15 or 20 years ago were these things called R&D partnerships, where you funded one product, you did it off balance sheet, and uh, Amgen, Genentech, Genzyme, kind of all the big guys um, did these partnerships. Um, third, we're trying to encourage the ability to repatriate the money that's sitting offshore on a favorable basis. Big pharma companies have about $95 billion, $100 billion um, offshore that they can't bring back into the United States. And then lastly, um, we've been discussing the role of uh, what we can do about net operating losses. Can we create a market for NOLs? Can we do something where the companies that, have these, that are in a loss position for so many years can somehow use that loss position to help them get financed? Um, we'll, see how, we'll see where any of that um, um, goes. So given that, what are the, some of the new mechanisms that people are thinking about in terms of funding their business? Um, the flavor of the day now is, is something called crowd, crowdfunding, which is where you let non-accredited investors come together and invest in companies and in startups. In the past, to make that, you had to be an accredited investor, you had to have a certain net worth and the like, and because of the internet and clubs that are starting and the like, this whole notion of um, crowdfunding is coming. And we'll see whether it takes off in biotech or not. The other thing we're seeing is the rise in, in many major cities of accelerators, where the accelerator it houses startup companies, coach them for a piece of the equity, introduce them to the VCs, and help them get the business off the ground. The third, the third thing that's happening with more frequency is um, the super angels. People that really, bought, and we see this in the tech business, we see it in Silicon Valley a lot, people that have made a fair amount of money in their business, uh, then joining together and helping to fund new startups. And then lastly, um, we're seeing the rise of secondary markets. There's actually a company called Second Market where instead of selling and buying stock um, over an exchange, you can do it off the exchange, and you do it in the second market. So it creates a market for these securities where employees and, and the like can actually buy and sell their shares without the company having to go public or get acquired. So there's a, there's a few new uh, funding mechanisms that are uh, being developed right now also that'll be interesting to see how it plays out.